Well, good morning, everyone. I was not sure yesterday, sitting on the ground at Washington Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., whether or not I would be with you here today because a volcano had erupted again. And I was told that uh, they were trying to reroute our flight. We did manage, my wife and I, to get across the, uh, the Atlantic on a rather different flight path than had been originally envisioned. And so here we are. Uh, we might be with you longer than anticipated, though. <laughs> I don't know. I have the pleasure this morning of introducing a friend of mine, uh, Mr. James Vogel. James is a barrister in the Inner Temple and the deputy head of his chambers. He's also the chairman of the Catholic Union. James has in, been involved in a number of cases, such as the Diane Pretty case and the Morning After Pill case. He is a convert from Anglicanism. I'm a convert myself, not from Anglicanism, but from atheism. So <laughs> I appreciate where you've come from. And the author, the author of a, a wonderful book, which I, in fact, have read. Because the last time I came to the Family Life International Conference here, I picked up a copy of The Life of the Blessed Charles of Austria. And as I went back uh, on the plane again with my wife to uh, Washington, D.C., she slept, and I couldn't put the book down. And so I, I, I appreciate that, that gift to, uh, to me and to the church. And he told me to mention he's married to the Catholic journalist Joanna Bogle. So, without further ado, I give you James Vogel. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for that warm introduction. And it's a great pleasure to see Steve again. He does fantastic work for um, the, the pro-life cause, for the defense of human life, and uh, indeed for the church and for us all. Uh, so it's always a, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to, to meet Steve. And it's also a pleasure and a privilege to be here with all of you. And uh, many thanks to the Clovis family, who also do fantastic work. Um, and not only for Family Life International, but uh, in all sorts of ways. And I'm happy to say that uh, I have the, the privilege, or I'm rather a bad one, of being uh, godfather to one of uh, Greg and Aggie's children. I don't know if she's here, Jacinta. Probably not. She's probably enjoying herself somewhere. Um, now, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk to you today is, um, is, is uh, my title is The Dash to Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia. Um, and I've just been rereading my, uh, my notes, and uh, they're a little technical, so I'll, I'll try and simplify matters. Um, it's, uh, it's not a happy story, um, either here in the United Kingdom or even in other countries. Uh, but I think um, we need to know the facts so we can face up to them, make our own personal decisions, and indeed campaign for, uh, uh, for better laws to protect human life. <clears throat> but uh, just to, so we can start on a, on a good note, I think um, one of the things that we can do, even if we can do nothing else, is to imitate uh, the last um, months, years, days of the late Pope John Paul II. Now, uh, he did a great many good things in his life, uh, which I don't need to trouble you with because you know already. But one of the things that I think that he did in the latter years of his life and, and months and days was he gave a testimony to the world, not just to the church, but to the whole world because he was constantly on television in, in the state and condition he was in, of how even in the last years of one's life uh, and even in the condition that he was in, which was seriously debilitating, uh, you, you can still witness to the truth and you can still witness to the usefulness uh, and to the uniqueness of, uh, of humanity uh, in yourself as a person, which I think he did. And I'm sure all of you will remember seeing him uh, on the television when he went to the balcony to try and speak to the crowd. And he wasn't able to speak, but in many ways he did speak. He, speak by, he spoke by his silence. He spoke by his testimony of uh, the, the uniqueness of uh, humanity, even in the condition that he was in. And it was only a matter of some days before he died. Uh, and I think that is something that all of us can do, even if we're not able to succeed in changing the law or, uh, or perhaps uh, do succeed in our campaigns. We can still testify in ourselves 
uh, to the uniqueness of humanity right up to the very end. And I would strongly urge you all to do that. And if you do that, it does set an example, not only for your friends and relatives, but also for the medical staff, the nursing staff, uh, who will be caring for you in your latter days, uh, because they too have been sorely and badly influenced by some of the changes that I'm going to be telling you about. So um, let, let's keep that in mind when we hear what uh, I'm afraid in some cases isn't all good news. Some of you, I'm sure probably most of you, will remember the case of Tony Bland back, uh, well, the younger ones probably won't, um, back in the, uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, the facts of the case were this. Tony Bland, who was then aged 17, uh, was seriously injured in the disaster which occurred at the Hillsborough football ground on the 15th of April 1989. Um, and he suffered crushed lungs, punctured lungs, and the supply of oxygen to his brain was interrupted. Uh, as a result, he sustained catastrophic and irreversible damage to the higher centers of his brain, the parts that do the thinking, which had left him since April 1989 in a condition known as permanent or persistent vegetative state, PVS. You probably read about that in the papers as well. Well, the medical opinion of all those who were consulted, and those and his doctors, uh, was more or less unanimous in diagnosing him uh, as being without uh, little or any hope of any improvement in his condition or recovery. Now, he hadn't made any kind of indication of his wishes in advance. I mean, he obviously hadn't anticipated going to uh, a football match and coming away uh, in, this, in PVS. Um, but nevertheless, despite that, with the agreement of his family and the hospital who were treating him, uh, declarations were sought from the High Court. And the declarations were that all life-sustaining treatment <coughs> and support, including nutrition and hydration, in other words, food and fluids, be withdrawn. The trial judge in the High Court, and then when it went to appeal to the Court of Appeal, granted those declarations. And the uh, the official solicitor who was acting on behalf of uh, Tony Bland then appealed to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords gave the declarations. They didn't overturn them. But they gave varying opinions. In general, it was held that despite the inability of uh, Tony Bland to consent to what was going on, bear that in mind, he, was in, he, he couldn't communicate, he was in PBS, uh, so he didn't give his consent to any of this. Despite that, uh, their, their lordships held that the physicians might lawfully discontinue treatment and support designed to keep the patient alive. This included termination of ventilation, nutrition and hydration by tube, and medical treatment except for the sole purpose of enabling him, as they put it, to end his life and die with the least pain, suffering and distress. Well, you don't need a ventilator if you're on PVS, so you can remove that and you're still alive. Uh, you don't actually need tube feeding if you're in PVS, so they can remove that and still feed you orally through the mouth. But it's very time consuming, it takes up a lot of nursing time. So what tends to happen is that patients in PVS get given a feeding tube through the nose or through the stomach wall. Um, so you had a very artificial situation where even though he could be fed orally, and if he were fed orally, that could not be withdrawn by order of the court, because they had given him a tube, the tube could be withdrawn. Now, the, the, the judges simply didn't address the issue of whether or not the nurses should then have fed him orally. They just, they just made an assumption that he was therefore to die. And we'll see that what the consequences of that were. Well, one of the judges, Lord Goff, distinguished the discontinuance of treatment in PBS cases, which could be lawful, and the positive act of administering a lethal dose, which would be unlawful. Now, on the face of it, that sounds fine. After all, nobody has a right to treatment. Uh, they have a right not to be treated negligently by a doctor. But if the doctor says, well, look, I'm, I don't think this treatment is, is going to help you, you can't demand it. You know, for example, um, there are drugs for uh, alleviating leukemia in young children 
but sometimes they're, they're very, very expensive, and sometimes they're withheld because they're really not going to do anything more than extend the child's life for a few months, and the, at a cost which is so disproportionate that it's just not worth it. Now, that's, most people would not have a problem with that, but that's rather different than giving somebody uh, or removing from somebody what is no more than a means of feeding them or hydrating them. Um, and what, we'll come on to that in a moment because that is really a key issue in all of this. It is a way in which those who have little or no regard for human life in the latter stages of an illness, it's the way in which they are introducing uh, what is in effect unlawful killing or euthanasia into our uh, health service. Here's what one of the judges said in Blatt, Lord Brown Wilkinson. Murder consists of causing the death of another with intent so to do. What is proposed in the present case is to adopt a course with the intention of bringing about Anthony Bland's death. So he knows he's bringing about the death of Anthony Bland. As to the element of intention, because in order for you to be convicted of murder, you have to have the intention to kill somebody. As to that, in my judgment, and there can be no real doubt that it is present in this case, so he's admitted there is the intention to kill, which on the face of it is murder. The whole purpose of stopping artificial feeding is to bring about the death of Anthony Bland. So they've gone further than simply withdrawing treatment, i.e. the tubes, if they are treatment, and gone one stage further and said, we're not even going to feed you orally. We are going to intentionally kill you. As to the guilty act, so you not only have to have an intention, but you have to have an act. It's all very well intending to murder somebody, but if you don't actually do it, there's no crime. As to the guilty act, the criminal law draws a distinction between the commission and the positive act which causes death, and the omission to do an act which would have prevented the death. Well, it's true, there is a difference. But let's hear the rest of what he says. The positive act of removing the nasogastric tube, that's the tube through the nose that feeds you, goes through the nose and down into the stomach. And there's no magic to this tube. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Try sticking a pencil up your nose and you'll find out. But it's not difficult to fit with a bit of training. So it's, it's not, there's nothing specially unusual or medical about a nasogastric tube. It's just a tube that goes into your stomach instead of through your, uh, through your um, mouth. He said this, the positive act of removing that tube pre presents more difficulty. <laughs> well, yes, it does. And so he had to reach this conclusion. This is, the, uh, this is one of the judges in the House of Lords. The conclusion I have reached will appear to some to be almost irrational. His own words. Lord Mustell, another of the, the judges, said this, the conclusion that the declarations can be upheld depends crucially on a distinction drawn by the criminal law between acts and omissions. We're back to acts and omissions again. The acute unease which I feel about adopting this way through the legal and ethical maze is, I believe, due in an important part to the sensation that however much the terminologies may differ, the ethical status of the two courses of action is, for all relevant purposes, undistinguishable. In other words, the act of taking somebody's life deliberately by a positive act and the act of taking somebody's life uh, deliberately by an omission. He's right. Morally, there isn't a distinction. <coughs> Except, I mean, provided you have a responsibility for the person's life, which a doctor plainly does have. By dismissing this appeal, said Lord Mustell, I fear that your Lordship's house may only emphasize the distortions of the legal structure which is already both morally and intellectually misshapen. Well, isn't that what judges are for? To straighten it out, not to make it misshapen? And yet they seem to be admitting that they were either making it misshapen or making it more misshapen, or at the very least, not straightening it out. In short, they appear to be admitting they weren't doing their job, which is a little bit troubling. Lord Goff attempted to draw a distinction between a doctor discontinuing tube feeding and a burglar doing the same, albeit both were seeking 
the death of the patient. And he, he drew that distinction by simply saying this, the doctor is simply allowing his patient to die of his pre-existing condition. Well, medically, that is simply wrong. Because if you are in the condition known as PVS, it's not terminal. If you have PVS and you don't treat it, you won't die. You become uncomfortable, you will suffer, but you won't die. Well, you might, but it's, it won't be for directly from PVS because it's not a terminal condition. So for him to say that the doctor is simply allowing the patient to die of his pre-existing condition is simply clinically and medically wrong. Now, I don't know what evidence, what the quality of the evidence that was given to the court by the doctors was, but it may have been that the, doc the judges were misled or didn't understand the clinical situation. Um, but they must understand now, surely, in which case this ought to be revisited, but it hasn't been. What has happened instead is that things have got worse and worse. They've gone further down this track. That, I suppose, is partly due to the nature in which these sorts of cases are handled. Um, and I think that needs revisiting as well. Well, since the case of Bland, there has been much discussion about the definition of the condition of PVS, persistent or permanent vegetative state. By the way, vegetative state doesn't mean you're a vegetable. If you start life as a, as a human being, uh, so far as we know scientifically, no one has yet turned into a tomato <laughs> or an apple or any other kind of vegetable. What it means is that you have vegetative function. Your vegetative functions are breathing, uh, the, the functions that occur automatically. Now, actually, there are more than that in, 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 in a lot of definitions of vegetative state. For example, the, uh, there's a, there was a dispute between the official solicitor and the royal colleges about whether or not you had what is tracking. Well, a patient who has PVS can follow a pen with his eyes. That's called tracking. Um, and, and though some said, well, in that case, he's not in PVS, others said, well, yes, he is. Well, if you have tracking, then you haven't just got vegetative function. So there may be a misnomer. Uh, and as you can readily see, there's plenty of scope for misdiagnosis. So it may well be that patients, indeed it has happened now, patients who are not actually in pe permanent or persistent vegetative state are being dehydrated to death. This is the danger. Once you cross this moral Rubicon, where do you stop? Once you decide that some lives are not worth living, then where do you stop? Um, so you can see that the judges partly realized that what they were doing was legally, morally, and practically confused and irrational. Uh, and so consequently, I would suggest that that is where we cross the moral Rubicon in the law in this country. And everything seems to flow and follow from that case. But nevertheless, that's what the judges did. They went ahead and did it. Now, I mentioned the distinction between treatment and sustenance. This is an important distinction. Because think of it this way. What is the difference between feeding a PVS patient by spoon, which is possible, as I said, but time consuming, and doing so by tube? How is it different from a baby's bottle? After all, that is a kind of tube. The baby can't feed itself, neither can a PVS patient. So the baby must be fed by a bottle. And it's a tube which delivers food through the mouth into the baby's stomach. Isn't that also? what a, a tube that feeds a PVS patient does? Um, well, the answer surely must be yes. You, fitting a tube might involve clinical procedures, uh, but as I've said, it can't in the case of a nasogastric tube because a nurse, a nurse can fit it. Indeed, you can fit one yourself with a little bit of instruction. So uh, to what extent is that really a clinical procedure? Well, it's a little bit more advanced than a baby's bottle, but not much. In the end, it is a delivery means to deliver to you food and fluids, which you can't deliver in the normal way with a knife, fork, spoon, and cup through your mouth, which I suppose, if you think about it, are themselves a form of 
delivery mean? So if you withdraw the cup, the fork, the knife, and the spoon, are you withdrawing treatment? Most people would say, no, you're starving somebody. The procedure is essentially one of sustenance, not clinical treatment. And if that were not so, then one would have to ask oneself this question. If the provision of nutrition and hydration, food and fluids, are treatment, and only treatment, what condition do they treat? Can't be PVS because food and fluids is not a specific or a remedy for PVS. Well, what do you have food and fluids for? Well, it's to prevent hunger and thirst. But hunger and thirst are not diseases. So, on the face of it, it can't be clinical treatment for a specific disease. And of course, common sense tells us it is of nothing of the kind. It is mere food and fluids, which all of us have twice or three times a day. And to withdraw that is not, or should not be, within the power of the medical or nursing profession. And yet, they've begun to be treated as such by hospitals, and even sometimes by the courts. The distinction, of course, is literally vital. Because if you withdraw hydration and, uh, and food, particularly hydration from anybody, they will be dead painfully, exquisitely painfully, said one euthanasia uh, supporter, within days. Now, a doctor, as I said, can withdraw treatment when he thinks it's not in the patient's best interest. And by the way, how can it not be in the patient's best interest to feed them? So even if it were treatment, there would still be issues about whether or not food and fluids is in the patient's best interest. There are some rare circumstances, well, they're not rare, but they're uh, very isolated circumstances uh, in the very, very last stages of dying where it, it would be counterproductive to give somebody food and fluids. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about a situation where the patient is still in need of food and fluids. Well, if food and fluids are withdrawn, then the patient, as I say, dies in a very unpleasant way. Well, how do they get over that? They purport to get over that by giving the patient sedation. But we don't know whether sedation actually does prevent the pain and suffering uh, that is caused by dehydration. Because it doesn't just affect the pain centers, which is what sedation will deal with. It affects the whole body. And the brain, through what are called osmoreceptors, tells the body it's in distress. And we don't know how that distress affects somebody who's dying from dehydration. And we have every reason to doubt that mere sedation isn't sufficient to deal with that. So it's actually cruel as well as uh, anti-life. Unfortunately, it is regarded in some of our hospitals, and I'm afraid in all of our hospitals by some doctors, as being a legal means of uh, bringing about a patient's, uh, or, or I better be careful, not bringing about a patient's death, let's say uh, it, it's, it's reasonable and legal in the latter stages of life, even if the patient does die of dehydration. Usually what happens is they give them a, a sedative, uh, they give them less food and fluids, and then they take the food and fluids away, the patient becomes weak, and they either die of dehydration or they die from weakness brought on by a combination of uh, dehydration and <coughs> uh, sedation. Sometimes they're simply sedated to death. They're just given uh, increasing doses of midazolam or uh, similar sedatives which carry them off. Um, this is no long, we're no longer then in the territory of an omission. That must be a positive act. Uh, and is therefore illegal, but it's, it's, it's happening. And we're moving in the direction of making even that legal. Unfortunately, it is already treated by some doctors and hospitals as if it were legal. And they get away with it because most people don't realize what's going on. And a lot of people will simply say, oh, well, this patient was going to die in a couple of weeks' time anyway, so does it really matter? Well, yes, it does matter. Because once you cross the moral Rubicon of deciding that some lives are not worth living, where do you draw the line? And you see, we didn't begin this particular journey with elderly people. We began it with Tony Bland, who was 17 and in PVS. 
So it doesn't just apply to people who are old, frail, and elderly. It can apply to anybody whose life is being decided, for whom it is, for whom it is being decided that their life is no longer worth living. And that is not a clinical judgment, that is a moral judgment. A number of cases have extended the principle after the case of Bland. And some of them you will have heard of. But one you won't have heard of, I'm sure, is the case of NHS Trust A against M and NHS Trust B against H. And in that, the then president of the family division of the High Court, Elizabeth Butler Sloss, ruled that removing the food and fluids from two patients, one of whom was in PVS and the other one only in what was described as near PVS, was not only lawful in English common law, but not contrary to the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights, Articles 2 and 3. Article 2 is the right to life. Article 3 is the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment uh, or torture. And she said this, in my judgment, the phrase deprivation of life must import a deliberate act. So we're back to the old positive acts and, um, and omissions. As opposed to an omission. In a case where, and this is, this is novel, what she says next, where a reasonable clinical decision is made to withhold treatment. On the ground that it is not in a patient's best interest, and the clinical decision is made in accordance with a respectable, respectable body, body of medical opinion. In those circumstances, she said, the state's positive obligation under Article 2, that is the right to life, is, in my view, discharged. Now, there are a number of strange things about that statement. First of all, we're not talking about a case of clinical negligence, where somebody treats you wrongly, badly, or negligently, so that you then go and sue the hospital. And yet, the test that she has applied there is a well-known legal test for negligence. But murder or homicide is not in the class of legal wrongs called negligence. It is in the class of legal, legal wrongs called assault, for which this test is irrelevant. So, with the greatest of respect to Lady, to Baroness Butler's loss. She's applied the wrong test to the, what is in effect an assault or potential assault. And what she's effectively said is that it's a matter for the doctors to decide because what happens in a negligence case is you get one lot of doctors will say, will come along and give evidence and say, well, this is how you, most doctors would do it. And if that's proven to be so, the case ends. But that doesn't apply to a situation where you have an assault. And of course, murder is the worst kind of assault. Not only that, but she's called it a reasonable clinical decision. How could, uh, that's back to the argument we were mentioning before. It's a moral decision to decide that somebody's life is not worth living. And to withdraw food and fluids from them isn't clinical. It's moral. And again, she says to withhold treatment. But again, is it treatment? Then she goes on to say, I am moreover satisfied that Article 3, that's in degrading and inhuman treatment, requires the victim to be aware of the inhuman and degrading treatment which he or she is experiencing. Well, that, that, that uh, again is a circular argument because how do we know that Tony Bland wasn't aware? Because uh, around the time of the Bland case and significantly more since, there have been a number of scientific studies showing that there are islands of intelligence and sensitivity, even in PVS patients. So she's making an assumption. She's already decided in advance that something is so when it may not be. Even Professor Emily Jackson, professor of medical law at Queen Mary College, University of London, a member of the BMA's Medical Ethics Committee and of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and the author of, a, of Medical Law, found all of this a bit difficult to follow. And she is no pro-lifer, quite the opposite. She, how can the right to life be protected if a doctor can simply say that fluids, drink, hydration, may be withdrawn from a patient, and when that patient dies of hydration, say, 
that was legal. It doesn't make sense. And how can the judge decide that dehydration, dying and death by dehydration, is not degrading and inhuman? It plainly is, especially if it's brought about deliberately. Now, as I say, Emily Jackson is no pro-lifer, but even she can see that Elizabeth Butler Sloss's logic is fundamentally and fatally flawed. And Emily Jackson says this, the judgment that Article 3, that's in degrading treatment, can only be violated if the victim is aware of the inhuman and degrading treatment is, with respect, more controversial. Failing to provide insensate patients with basic care would unarguably be to treat them in an inhuman and degrading fashion. So says Emily Jackson. Now, no, um, that was a, a decision of Elizabeth Butler's loss that was in the High Court. So it hasn't gone to appeal. Perhaps there may be an appeal about that issue in due course, but at the moment, that's the law. Um, because the judges have the right to tell us what the law is. It's their job. But imagine if a man failed to care for his child and the child died. Who would ever accept as his defense that he did no positive act but simply omitted to feed the child or care for the child. And so he was blameless and had committed no offense. Nobody, of course, would accept such nonsense. But why, therefore, did the president of the family division accept what amounts to virtually the same defense when it came to Tony Bland, when it came to Miss M and Miss H. I don't know. You'll have to ask her. But let's face it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And how could this be improved simply because the decision to omit food and fluids was made by a doctor? How does that make it better? Surely it makes it worse. It's bad enough for the father to do that to his child. But for a doctor who's a trained professional, knowingly and deliberately to do that in a hospital environment is, on one view, worse, isn't it? Unless, of course, the courts are seeking to give doctors the right to determine whose life is worthy of life and whose life is not worthy of life. And that is a rather chilling phrase, life unworthy of life. It's a sinister phrase, and it has been used before on this continent of Europe by those eugenicists and others whose theories gave rise to the social Darwinism of the 1930s in Germany and elsewhere. Do we really want to go back to that? Well, one, had, one need only ask the question for the answer to be instantly answered. No, of course we don't. But it didn't end there. There were a number of other cases, and there some of them you will have heard of. You heard I was in, myself, the Diane Pretty case. Diane Pretty was a woman who had motor neurone disease. She sought permission from the Director of Public Prosecutions for her husband to assist her suicide. This was refused by all courts right the way up to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, there was, it's true, an, in, an enhancement of the principle of autonomy, the right to determine what happens to yourself, which was a little troubling, but on balance, uh, the judges came down and said, no, sorry, we're not going to allow that. Uh, but there followed thereafter the case of Leslie Burke. And he had cerebellar ataxia, another progressively, uh, progressive disease. <clears throat> and he sought clarification from the court that he would not be denied food and fluids when his condition worsened and when he couldn't communicate and ask and insist upon food and fluids. The high court found in his favor but, again, emphasizing autonomy. The Court of Appeal, however, overturned the decision. They said, well, if he asks for food and fluids and doesn't get it, then the doctor would have no defense to a, a charge of murder. But that wasn't the question he was really asking. The question he was asking is, what happens when I can't ask for food and fluids? And the Court of Appeal declined to answer that question. They said, well, he hasn't made an advance directive. And we'll have to wait and see when he's in that condition. Which was, of course, nothing more than a fight. 
of this very important moral question. Sad to say. Well, the case coincided with the Mental Capacity Act, an act which brought in living wills and advanced directives. And shortly thereafter, we had the case, the recent case, of Debbie Purdy. Again, she had motor neuron disease, like Diane Pretty, only this time her lawyers were a bit cleverer. They said, well, we don't want you to give her permission, her husband permission to, uh, to, give, to assist her suicide. We just want to know what is the guidance that the Director of Public Prosecutions has in determining which cases he'll prosecute and which ones he won't. Well, again, why should the Director give that guidance? It's there in the law. Follow the law. And that is what the, House of, the High Court said. That is what the Court of Appeals said. But when it went to the House of Lords, the very last judgment of the House of Lords before it became the Supreme Court, they said, very strangely, yes, we're going to require the Director of Public Prosecutions to, to, to give that guidance, which he duly did in February of this year, and which he felt constrained by this judgment to say, well, we won't prosecute in compassionate cases. But they're all compassionate cases, aren't they? Most people who say they're assisting somebody's suicide say they're doing so because of compassion. So does that mean we're not going to prosecute any of these cases? Well, we'll have to wait and see. And it all turned on the issue of autonomy. You have the right to determine what happens to your body. Well, that's all very well, but what about the doctor who you're requiring to withdraw your food and fluids or to give you a lethal injection? What about the nurse? Uh, what about the family who are left behind when you have committed suicide or when you've gone to the clinic in Zurich or anywhere else? You see, the, the act of suicide is not a single isolated act. It affects other people and it particularly affects the medical and nursing profession who have to allow or indeed even participate in the act. And if, in case there's any doubt about that, <clears throat> and let me tell you, that in the case of the Mental Capacity Act, there was on the part of our bishops um, because they formed the view that the Mental Capacity Act wasn't such a bad thing, uh, particularly after they've had negotiations with the government. Uh, we, we can look at the case that was decided at the end of last year of Kerry Wolverton. And she came into, court, into casualty having swallowed petrol. I strongly advise against doing that. <clears throat> painful way to go. And she was armed with a letter uh, which had been endorsed by her solicitor in which she said she did not want to be revived, she just wanted to be uh, kept pain free. The doctors felt in the light of the Mental Capacity Act that they couldn't do anything other than what she asked and so she died. Well the coroner gave his decision at the end of last year. And incidentally, she did this directly after the Mental Capacity Act came into force, or right about that time. And the coroner said, the doctors are not blameworthy. What they did is not unlawful. Thus proving the very point we had made about the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, and indeed, arguably, the doctors might have been acting unlawfully if they had assisted her, and, or at least prevented her from dying. That is a very troubling development. Now, I, I'm s sorry to say, nothing has emanated by way of a clarification from our Bishop's Conference. In fact, two press releases came out the day of that judgment, both contradicting each other, <laughs> which wasn't helpful, to put it mildly. <clears throat> one said one thing, and another said the exact opposite. And there's been no clarification since, <clears throat> despite uh, uh, our asking for it. Well, I need hardly say how unsatisfactory this situation is. The result now is that the NHS is in danger of becoming an unfriendly place for the sick, elderly, uh, and those whom doctors might deem to have a life unworthy of life, which could be any of us. And there has been a tendency, as I said, to, to, uh, to combine dehydration with sedation. Uh, so that people uh, die earlier than they should. And to give you another example, somebody who was put on a particular care pathway, having been diagnosed with cancer, and this particular care pathway called the Liverpool Care Pathway, uh, you are likely, the median time for you to survive on it is 30 hours with cancer, 35 hours without. 
And this particular patient, his name was, he was a Welshman called Jack Jones, died on that Liverpool care pathway. And when a, a post-mortem was carried out, it was discovered he'd been wrongly diagnosed. He did not have any cancer. And yet he'd been put on this Liverpool care pathway and is now dead. You see the danger once you cross this moral Rubicon where you draw the line. And of course, how do you prevent the danger of misdiagnosis resulting in deaths that should never occur? Well, as I said, even Emily Jackson, no pro-lifer, is troubled. <clears throat> Not as troubled as I am, uh, but nonetheless, it's indicative of the situation that she is troubled because she's certainly, as I say, not a pro-lifer. And she concludes in her book, Medical Law, as follows. Insofar as the potential for abuse exists, it is surely incompetent patients, in other words, ones who can't communicate, like Bland, like many an old person who's had a stroke. Many people fall into that category. Incompetent patients, rather than competent patients, who are most at risk. This is from a professor of medical law. Yet again, comparatively few safeguards exist when doctors take decisions, such as the withdrawal of artificial ventilation, and one might add artificial feeding, tube feeding, which will end the lives of their incompetent patients. I agree with Emily Jackson, it is troubling. The, in my view, the unnecessary confusion of moral principles, starting with the case of Tony Bland, has taken us down a path from which we will only turn back with some difficulty because it becomes a bit of a roller coaster. We've been down this road once before in the continent of Europe. And I suggest to you, it's not a road we want to go down again. Thank you very much. position of people now who attempt suicide but they're not successful when they go to hospital will they be treated will they be brought back the question is what is the position with people who've attempted suicide unsuccessfully and then go into hospital uh, will they be treated the answer is yes they will uh, at the moment um, unless the doctors form the view that they don't wish to be revived or treated now, in the case of Kerry Walterton, it was clear because she came with a letter endorsed by her solicitor. Uh, but most people are not going to do that. Uh, and at the moment, I think most hospitals would say, particularly if it's a younger person, uh, this is a cry for help and we, uh, we'll, we will revive the person. Indeed, if they didn't, it would, there, there, there would be potential actions against the, the hospital. The difficulty, we haven't gone so far that they're just not going to treat somebody who has attempted suicide. The difficulty comes when they have a note in their file saying, I don't wish to be revived, or when somebody gives evidence, perhaps a, a person holding a power of attorney, that they're sure they didn't want to be revived. Uh, or perhaps if they're in a terminal condition and they've committed suicide or attempted suicide in that terminal condition, um, the, pay, the doctors might say, well, perhaps she really did want to die early because of her condition. So um, those are the sort of circumstances where they're unlikely to be treated. We haven't got to the stage now where any person coming off the street having committed su attempted suicide isn't treated. No, but that, if we got to that situation, that really would be appalling. Um, so uh, we're a long way off from that. Uh, but just, we're, we're in the early stages uh, of um, the problem area, but the problem is in the earlier stages, vulnerable people, uh, the elderly in particular, uh, are potentially in danger. And that is already a very serious worry, rather than uh, the position of somebody who's attempted suicide. Yeah, um, 
my point is, isn't it positive law in the UK or Europe now really influenced by a philosophy of life, which is basically utilitarianism? Is basically the valuation of life in economicistic terms promoted by philosophers like Peter Singer, for example, and actually, philosophically, the root of the problem is Kantianism or the neo-Kantian view of the subjective um, judgment of the will of the person, as opposed to the realistic worldview that the Catholic Church has always promoted, that there is an objective truth. So basically, what we see in positive law isn't it really the adoption, the wholesale adoption of this sort of utilitarian philosophy, for, for which the, the, the British are quite famous as well, going back from to Bentham and John Stuart Mill and what have you. Would you confirm that it is really an embracement of this philosophy? Um, in a nutshell, is is this all down to a uh, retreat from objective morality into a morality of utilitarianism? The answer to that is. Yes. Uh, I don't think we've quite gone as far as Professor Peter Singer, uh, who thinks that all living creatures should have the same rights. I don't know whether he thinks humans and amoeba should have the same rights, but that's uh, the logical extension of his view. Uh, and that uh, in the same way that we, we kill kittens or animals we don't want, then we can do the same with human beings, perhaps up to the age of about two. We haven't gone that far. But we're certainly going down the route that's, the, that's been laid for us by people like Ronald Dworkin, a legal philosopher, and very much a utilitarian. So the answer is yes. Um, yes, I've come across several examples of elderly patients who've been euthanized in hospital, and the coroner has given as the cause of their deaths their original ailments, not the euthanasia. Yes, that's Did happening. Hear the, question? the question is, um, uh, I have come across several cases where doctors have uh, euthanized patients, elderly patients, but put down on the death certificate the cause of death being their, their original illnesses, their original reasons for being admitted to the hospital. Yeah, that, that, one has to be a bit careful about that because sometimes a patient, quite often a death certificate will say, pneumonia, but, but, but I mean a lot of conditions result in death by pneumonia. Um, but yes, uh, that, that is happening, um, unfortunately. We in the pro-life movement do not expect uh, public accolades from the larger society, uh, rather the opposite I would say, but we should honor our own, and so we in the Family Life International Family would like to give James Vogel, an Apostle of Life Award uh, for the Family and Life International World Congress held here in London, England today, May 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I put it back in there? Well, yes. Thank you. Well, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>